Well, Carlin, pleasure to secure your time, sir. Pleasure to be here. I, I, I hope you mean that. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I do. Even with your accent, it is still a pleasure to be here. <laughs> with, I don't know what you mean. I don't know what you mean. <laughs> when I was growing up, when I was growing up watching, uh, watching you on TV, I did not think this would be happening. I didn't even know. What to, I wouldn't have even anticipated a podcast back then. But I shout to James Deegan for uh, the intro. Very kind of him indeed. And um, yeah, let's see, let's see what happens. I think I know the answer, maybe, but it may not be the answer. I've been surprised on several of the podcasts I've done for Leading Mind series already. But tell me, what is your most memorable leadership position and why? Uh, much as I, I would like to surprise you, um, yeah, <laughs> I think it's the only one I've ever had, um, which was which was captaining England um, at rugby. So why? Because I suppose since I was um, six or seven, um, I loved rugby. Um, I used to watch uh, the Five Nations as, as it was then. Um, I used to watch England. And my dream was, was to play for England. I never thought I would. Um, I, I never dreamt of captaining them. So it was just like that was, you know, the biggest honour that that I could ever I could ever dream of, and um, when it happened, it was pretty surreal. Um, but it was uh, it was just incredible. Did you could you not did you not start to anticipate it as as your rugby career um, as your rugby career start you know took off, and as you 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 know you got your England caps? Did you not sort of anticipate it coming? Did you not see sort of leadership in yourself of that team? As a no. Potential? It, it, at the end of the day, I, I sort of um, I, I got capped by default in uh, in the February because it, way back in those days we had a final trial and the two guys who were meant to play in my position um, were, were picked. Both got injured um, the night before, which was tragic. Um, so uh, I got picked. So that that was February and and I was 22 or whatever it was and um, and I got made captain in the November. So I was still only 22. Um, and it was eight months later, so no, I didn't. And I remember there was all this speculation about who was going to be captain. Um, and lots of people were mentioned, talked in the press. No one ever, <laughs> ever mentioned my name. And I remember standing with um, like Peter Winterbottom, Simon Halliday. We were in Richmond Rugby Club watching something. We'd had the, we had the weekend off before um, we were sort of going into squad and uh, into a squad um, training session. And, and, and everyone was sort of, debating it and the Hallers was they were sort of going Simon yeah it could be you and Winch could be you and this that and the other and I'd already had the phone call from Jeff Cook telling me on the Thursday he wanted me captain and he said we just don't you're not allowed to tell anyone so I sort of let, as a joke I went so do you know what guys I think it could be me and they all just looked at me and went shut up you know I mean really <laughs> shut up um, and I'm like oh this is going to go well <laughs> <laughs> What's it like? What's it like um, trying to manage a uh, a team of alphas? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? I, I would uh, I would far prefer that than um, than not because you've got you've got people who want to you know you want to do it they um, they want to go out they want to win um, and you're thinking and they're most of the time, you know, they're um, they're mentally, you know, they're pretty tough. They're focused. Um, yeah, they're opinionated. They're, they're they're strong and all that lot. But you think, great. But I, I think, geez, you know, as I, when I stood up in front of them, you just it was just a you. I was petrified. But secondly, I remember it just hit me. We're thinking, what, almost what you were saying. There's all this knowledge and experience that is sitting here. And I just thought, if I can actually start harnessing this, you start telling me what we need to change. We weren't doing well. And I just, I looked at them and I thought, geez, you are, you are great players. What do we need to change, guys? In, in all sorts, of, it, on, off the pitch, everything. And all I used to do was basically just act as a sort of, um, as a filter, sit with the coaches and say, this is what we need to do. And, and it slowly changed like, like that. So it wasn't sort of, you know, rah, rah, follow me, because they would have laughed and walked out. Um, it was, we want to win. We need to change. How are we going to do it? It's a really interesting point there. Well, actually, um, one of the recurring one of the recurring sort of topics that's coming up on the business podcast, the, the business guests, the guests who've never been military or never been uh, you know in sports 
um, is the challenge of getting emotional investment from your staff into what you were doing. And I think certainly on the military side, there's an element of emotional investment. People volunteer, British military to join up. And it's, it's, I think it's the same with the sporting world. You said it there. The team wanted to be there. You've got that emotional investment there. So, yeah, interesting. What, through all that, um, what was your most memorable, memorable or your most significant mistake? Uh, we, uh, we went up to play um, Scotland in 1990. It was the last game. It was for, for a Grand Slam for them as well. Um, and we played really well during that championship. And my biggest mistake was there'd been the Lions tour um, the sort of the summer before. Um, and I hadn't gone on because I, I, I missed it because I'd fractured my leg. And there was a lot of the English and the Scots guys on there. And in the build up to this game, um, there was a lot of talk about the English that the Scots weren't very good. You know, we're gonna, we've, we've got them. And we were arrogant. Um, we were conceited. We didn't ever entertain the fact the the fact that they were going to try things. That they were a good side. Um, they would try and put us out of our rhythm. You know, uh, let's predict. Let's anticipate all the things that might. Do. We, not once. It was just about us. We're good. Went up there, got beaten. Um, and during the game, I asked the wrong guys at the wrong time. You know, I sort of you know, asked Brian Moore. Brian Moore gets red missed on about a Thursday evening, and um, you know, for him, thought returned on about Tuesday. Uh, Richard Hills come up, I mean, and it was almost like you know. Will afterwards, I remember sitting there thinking, you don't know your players well enough. You didn't, and I remember listening to them thinking in the build-up, and they were talking about Scotland, thinking this is this is not right. And I never sat down and said, guys, this this is wrong, because I wanted to be popular, and um, I didn't want to, you know, go against the grain, and I didn't want to um, annoy guys. And you just think, actually. It, it was huge for me, so many mistakes. And you just thought, and I sat down and, you know, you went through all the bits that I'd got wrong and there were loads of it. And just think, you know, not again. Um, you know, we want to win. I, I, I want them to win. I want us to win. And therefore, it's not about being popular. It's not about being liked. It's about doing the right things, about knowing your players and telling them straight at times and, and listening to it straight at times. And just lots of things that I, I learned from that massively. Um, it, it, I think it's the most painful. It was the most painful defeat um, out of all the games. It was the most painful one. And what, how did you? Is there anything major that you changed in the way you were leading after that? Then, I, I, particularly around that relationship with the team and, and understanding them, because there's a fine balance, right, between uh, the confidence you need to succeed in your own abilities and arrogance, as you mentioned. And yeah. we referenced it earlier. You got a team of alphas. People who think they can do anything, um, as in they can achieve anything, and you need that. But it, uh, what, so what, was, it, what did you change? It was most, mostly sort of trying to the way we try to communicate, the honesty. You know, we'd sit there and go, okay, when, when we'd come up against teams, say, right, guys, let's let's be honest. You know, what, what do they do better than us? And there were still guys in our team who you know couldn't accept that there was anything. And you're going, guys, come on, let's be honest, right? <laughs> If we can work it out, then we can anticipate where they're going to come at us and we can work out how to, you know, accentuate the things that we do well. But there were some who would never, you know, no, 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 they're not. No, no, you know, and you go, well, they, okay, they, I think they are. Well, they certainly got parity with us and, you know, what are their strengths? And, and it was fascinating. So it was, it was about um, getting really good um, communication. I introduced upward appraisal in a rugby team. I wanted them to appraise me. Um, you know, what did I, I need to, I need to improve. So tell me, and it was brutal. Um, but it was, for me, it was a sign that actually you've got to be able to take on board uh, and show them that you can take on board uh, their views. And I, sometimes in business, you know, I listen to businesses and they say, yeah, no, no, we have upward appraisal. It's anonymous, but we have it. And I'm thinking, wow, if I'm being real, what's, what's the sign that shows to me that the leaders aren't strong enough to accept your view, my view, you know, they, they can hand it down to us. They can probably tell you and review you and appraise you. But if it has to be anonymous, why? You know, it's incredible. It's like you've got to be big enough and strong enough and, and, and honest enough to, to actually want to hear. You know, it's, it's an honor to lead people. If you're going to lead people, the least you can do is sit there and listen to their views of, about you and, and understand how they see you and therefore, you know, work out how you can best lead them. And if you, 
if you don't have that respect for the people that you lead, well, why the hell should they follow you anyway? It's a really interesting point about the anonymity. I mean, I know it's there, a lot of the times it's there to encourage people to say something in the first place because people, you know, it's certainly in the business world, but it's a really good point about the anonymity. You know, if if people won't say something unless it's anonymous, then it, it scream it says things about the the that the environment's not right. Mm, interesting. Yeah. But the I mean the thing is that that's common across the board though with businesses these days. It's you know, it's predominantly predominantly anonymous, right? Mm. Yeah, and I'm um, thinking that it's sad that yeah, anyway, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> What's less desirable? What is less desirable? A strong team with a weak leader or a weak team with a strong leader? I think it's a weak team with a strong leader because I, I've never agreed with the idea that um, teams have just one leader. You know, in sport, it's not about one guy. I think there's, you know, in rugby, you, you know, 15 guys on the pitch, you need three, four people who are leading, making decisions, feeding information around. You know, OK, one guy ultimately has, do we go to penalty? But you've got leaders, you need leaders within um, your team. So I, my view on that would be you can have a strong team with a weak leader and you've got enough characters who can still make sure that you end up um, winning um, and being successful. And I think in, in a way, um, <laughs> that's what England had for eight years. But um, it was, uh, <laughs> but uh, I think um, you know a strong leader with a weak team. Uh, you know, it's yeah, it's not about one person. Uh, that's that's my take on it. Mm. Yeah, I think we're inclined to agree. One of the one of the th one, I mean, on sort of the same topic. One of the things I learned when I was serving, uh, and there was there was a point where there was a point where I got we were going on a tour, and I got given. I basically had people. I was in a, I was in a sniper platoon, so people who are experienced and um, you know specific set of skills, and you know you don't go there if you're an idiot, should we say? And I was very privileged to be there. I was very proud to be in that platoon. And before before a tour, a pretty important tour, we had to bump our numbers up. We needed more people for the, for our tasks that we were going to get. But we didn't have the qualified snipers there. And um, and the rifle companies didn't want to give us any of their guys who'd been in for a while. We had, well, we got a few like that, but we also ended up getting people straight from straight from training. We basically got people who weren't who we looked on as as, as weak. And one of the things that I I learned from that period is that every single one of those people that we got, there was something they they had something about them. There was a skill in there. Maybe it wasn't shooting. Maybe it wasn't you know not being seen, snuggling about. But they had a skill or something that we could identify and bring into the team. That could have just been banter. They were good at banter. Crap and everything else. Couldn't sell you for shit. But they were good at banter. When the morale was down that you bring it up. And I think just on the you know the, the, the weak when you the perceived sort of weaknesses. It was a really important lesson for me. Everyone's got something everyone has got something that that can benefit the team. The hard part is finding it. And I, I completely agree with you. It's, it's fascinating. There was, because when I was first captain, I was 22. I sat on selection, which was was quite bizarre. So you're sitting and selecting, you know. And these guys were all my heroes. I'd seen them on TV when I was a kid at school. So, but there was one time we we were we were selecting, and I, I won't name because that's unfair. But I, I was talking about um, you know a certain position, and I wanted a certain guy to play. Um, and uh, Jeff Cook, who's in charge, was talking about another guy. Surprisingly, he picked the other guy, you know, and I remember I spat my dummy out like a spoiled kid, um, you know, went to my room and thought, I can't believe he's picked this guy. Um, and I sat there, I thought, so what are you going to do? Make it patently obvious that you don't rate this guy because that's not your job. So I sort of got a piece of paper out and said, right, OK, he's picked him for certain reasons. I, and I wrote down, these are what I think his strengths are. And I used to read this before I went into meetings with him so that actually I felt that's the way I think about him not the stuff that I was holding. And actually, we, it was the first year we won a Grand Slam. He was outstanding. And he was genuinely outstanding. And I remember sitting afterwards and you thinking, he had, as you say, skills and ability that I just didn't think about because he wasn't what I thought should be playing in that position. But it was a real lesson of, we do all have 
special abilities. And I think really, really great leaders are the ones who manage to to see that in all their people and actually de- and manage to develop it. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. The, in fact, so moving, moving away from that slightly or entirely, what, what aspect of your, of your personal life most was most impactful on, on, on your profession? What, what was it that, that had that had a negative impact on your profession or just sort of limited the, the, the capacity you're able to throw it, throw it, throw in leading the team? And how did you, how did you overcome it? If you did? Uh, Do you know what, if if you're being brutally honest, um, it it was um, rugby, England was number one in my life. So I didn't let anything impact on it, Um, which is hence why part of my my sort of private life ended up as as, as quite a mess, (laughs) to say the least, Um, because rugby was it. That was my focus. Um, And I didn't let anything... um, you know, I remember my mother, who's who's no longer with us. I'd had a big argument with her, and on a Thursday evening, we were in the team hotel for a game. She rang to to um, to ask, you know, to talk to me about it. And it went, my phone went in my room, and I sort of picked it up. And he says, "Mum," I said, "I don't have time for this." I said, "I'll ring you on Monday." And I just put the phone down on it, and I look back and think, "Wow, you heartless um, little shit, basically." Um, but that was me. It was like, that was my, that's what I was there for. That's, you know, my view was I was, you know, you had players to think about, um, care about this, that and the other. And I, she wasn't, she wasn't in that um, circle. She wasn't in my team. So I didn't have time for her at that point. I would deal with it later on. And you look back and you think, wow. Um, And it's only actually after I sort of retired that, uh, you know, I got, I got married, Lisa and and, and kids and, and you, I look at the fact that you can't, with, with family, you, you, you can't be that selfish, you know. I well, you can, but you probably won't have a family for very long. Um, and the way it changes you and the way it broadens the view on what's actually really important in life is, is, is massive. Yeah, I, I think, cause I, I think uh, my own experience is very, very similar to yours in terms of the learning aspect of what I learned from it. And what I believe now is, is that if... If you treat the, the person, if you treat yourself well, as in you give yourself the things that make, you know, as in those, those typical things that all the psychologists, everyone says you need, you know, downtime, take a break from work, physical activity, you know, outside of what you do for playing for England tonight. Um, I see that now and making time for my family and making time for my kids and my, 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 my missus, as I see them as they actually, they, they do it properly. I completely break away from work. They make me more, it makes me more productive at work. I get more done than I would have otherwise. I've switched myself off and I've reset the brain. It's been a really hard thing to learn, really hard. Uh, it's taken far too long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but do you know what? Lots of people I don't think get there. Um, and, and, and I suppose that's, that's the bit that, that I have realized is that actually, you know, People ask me, you know, was was that was it great playing Bingham? Was it great running out and this, that and the other? And and you go, Yeah, it was. But you know what's way better is is family, as friends, it's relationships. And I genuinely mean that, that I think the greatest things in life are your friendships, your relationships, your family. And I think it, maybe it's only as you get older that you realise those are the things that you really do have to invest in. The rest of it is is noise and 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 it's got fleeting moments of um, of great adrenaline and all the rest of it, but it's not what gives you real, um, real happiness. Um, and I think yeah, that that's something that you know I, I only learned after you know I finished playing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Finishing off, Will. What what's the most important quality in a successful leader? It, it's hard, isn't it? You, you know, is it? Is it charisma? Is it, um, there's all sorts of, um, is it bravery? Is it, you know, uh, confidence? Part of me thinks it, 
maybe the thing that underpins all of it is, is honesty. Because um, I think, you know, being authentic, being genuine as a leader le needs honesty. Uh, honesty about yourself and honesty with the people that you lead. I think if, if, if you're honest, it's, it's very hard um, not to respect someone who, who, is, who is honest. I remember um, we were chatting before we recorded about my huge, extensive, and and um, hugely impressive military career. Um, <laughs> I, I remember being on 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 exercise, uh, and you know, so so the time that I was meant to be in the army, and it was only when I was at university to spend in the in the officers' mess, and and then we were going on a three week exercise, and I remember saying to the commanding officer, "Can I just go in in the, in the back of the trucks because I can't pretend to be an officer? I haven't got a clue what I'm meant to be doing. You know, I'm a university student." And he gave me a very strange look, but eventually he said, "Yeah, yeah, okay." So for about two days, the guys just sort of looked at me um, and then, you know, they start, we started chatting and I found those three weeks the most useful uh, in terms of learning what leadership was. And I remember sitting with this guy about three or four in the morning, um, Welshman, and I'm convinced he was called Hull, um, <laughs> uh, a sergeant. And I was saying, you know, I'd heard all this stuff about what, why officers thought they were great officers. And I said to him, you know, what's it about? And, and he, he's, he's great, actually. I'll tell you what, Will, he says, uh, what he really love in a, in a good officer, he said, is actually, he said, he's just, he's honest with us. He's fair. He said, there's no cliques. He doesn't treat anyone differently. He tells us what the values are and he sticks to it so that we're all treated honestly and we're all treated the same. He said, it's very basic, Will. He said, but I tell you what, I would follow that sort of officer anywhere. And I was like sitting there thinking, it, it, it's true, isn't it? There's, um, it's how you behave. And, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's lots of stuff. We can dress it up in so many ways, but actually you treat people fairly, you treat people honestly, and you behave the way that, you know, you, you talk about, you know, it's a foundation, isn't it? There's lots of other bits to it, but I think it's a foundation. Yeah. Uh, just to commend you on that Welsh accent, that was very, very good. <laughs> very, very good. Um, it, you're right, mate. And a recurring, again, on this question, a recurring answer to that is around honesty and integrity. Yeah. And the more I hear people like you talk about it, the more I sort of think about it. And th that, that I think the measure of your integrity in yourself, that has got to be one of the most critical underpinning qualities that lays the foundations for everything else in you as a person. I think maybe I may be wrong. Um, you know, I don't like dishonest people. You know, uh, and and it's immediately obvious when they are because just the way they hold themselves, the way they speak, the way <laughs> the mannerisms, you know, the score. Now, interesting. Yeah, it's a, definitely. I completely agree. And it's listen, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Oh, I've enjoyed um, it. Anything else you want to mention before we knock it on the head? No, 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 no. It's uh, it's been good. I've enjoyed it. Good. We shall. Uh, we should maybe do it again. And uh, yeah, the military career. Yeah. I did not realise. I did not realise. I'll be in touch again about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'll be well, a short podcast then. <laughs> it's been a pleasure, mate. Thanks.